Namaste, everyone. A very Namaste. warm welcome to today's session. The title of today's talk is Choosing Happiness, Hope. Our guest speaker is Ms. Audrey Carlson, who is the founder of the Hartford Happiness Club in Hartford, Connecticut, USA. She is an example that is easy to admire but difficult to emulate. In the year 2002, her elder daughter, Elizabeth, was murdered at the tender age of 24 years by her former boyfriend. After getting shattered by the totally unexpected, unspeakable loss, she and her family made a conscious choice and a deliberate commitment to live in order to stall the great risk of drowning in an endless sea of despair. She returned to graduate school and achieved a master's in holistic health and healing and immersed herself in the business of healing. Her journey took her behind prison walls, asking about forgiveness and love. She became empowered and fueled through a new understanding of what happens to people in the absence of love. She devoted herself to working with children and animals to remind herself that there is much more good than evil in this world. Her family established a foundation for the performing arts in Elizabeth's name and honor to keep her dreams and presence alive and vibrant. Four years ago, Audrey took a certification course in positive psychology. As part of her final project, she established the Hartford Happiness Club. Since then, she has invited dozens of speakers to come and share their stories and their wisdom about creating the life all of us most want to live. Audrey's mentor, whom she calls her chosen dad, is Dr. Bernie Siegel, the deeply spiritual doctor best known for his bestsellers, Love, Medicine and Miracles, Peace, Love and Healing, 365 Prescriptions for the Soul, and many more. His recent book, Love, Animals and Miracles, full of amazing tales of the love between animals and man and between different animal species, has a story, The Bridge is Love, by Audrey Carlson. Audrey, ma'am, we are truly honored and glad to have you with us today on the Yes platform. Thank you so, so much for joining us. We eagerly look forward to your session, ma'am. Over to you. Runima, thank you. And most importantly, with gratitude and love, Ramesh, it has been a pleasure knowing you, getting to know you, and continuing to grow and cultivate the friendship that we have begun just months ago. And what I'd like to do first, uh, if I may, is just tap into the fact that there truly are no coincidences. And I have known this pretty much my entire life, and yet it is always being validated with how my life unfolds pretty much every day. And it's got to be, I don't know, the end of August, something like this, perhaps, when um, I received this lovely, lovely email from Ramesh looking for Dr. Bernie Siegel, and he found me because Bernie Siegel has been an integral part of my life for 18 years since I took my positive cycle, since I took the integrative health and healing master's program with him. And through the happiness club that I launched after positive psychology, because Bernie is a big part of the happiness club, Ramesh found me and we met and we spent one of the most memorable afternoons being in his presence was truly a gift and I reflect on it all the time. Through that visit, we made a phone call and we arranged to meet with Bernie Siegel at his home. And for Ramesh and for me, it was truly a gift because it was a, a dream come true for Ramesh. And it was yet another 
gift for me in a sense where I was able to connect people together that are like-minded, that live the same life, walk the same path. And it filled my heart and it continues to fill my heart. And being here today is deeply appreciated. So thank you. So let me begin with, uh, again, Audrey Carlson. I live in Newington, Connecticut. I have lived here 47 years. My goodness, I've lived in New England my whole life. I am married. Uh, my husband and I had two daughters, Elizabeth and Leslie, and our two poodles. And I, to this day, regard my life as being blessed. Because for me, I believe that God has innately given me a gift of positivity, of resilience, and the gift of looking at what I have, not what I don't have, paving the way with gratitude through my life, regardless of what has happened and what may continue to happen. I live my life through gratitude. So let me begin with the fact that I've been asked many, many times how I came from the aftermath of the unimaginable to the launching of a happiness club. Because 22 years ago, May 22nd, our daughter, as I, as you mentioned, and I thank you for your kind words. Uh, they were very, very much appreciated. 22 years ago, I could not imagine the word happiness even in the realm of my world. Our lives were shattered. I couldn't breathe. I was struggling with severe anxiety, PTSD, and thrown into a world I could not imagine. In addition to the grief, the loss, and the horrific nicks of the fact that she was murdered and shot to death in our house, I don't look at our home as anything but love. Our house represents love. And I had to not only learn how to breathe through a lot of therapy with my family and singly and collectively, um, I had to make a choice. And I understood that no one is going to go through life without loss, grief, pain, trauma, disappointment, failure. It's what we choose to do with it. And Bernie Siegel says, we are always and forever will be living in that world of uncertainty where that one constant in life is change. And we are always being redirected and to understand that something good will come of it. Now, was I able to wrap my head around any of that back 22 years ago? Of course not. Of course not. Grief transforms us all. And about a year and a half or so, maybe even two, it was 20 years ago, in fact, I made a decision that I had so many unanswered questions and life took me to a running group that I was affiliated with. And I was out running with my friends and they um, invited me back to their, she invited me back to her house where she was studying the graduate program as a nurse for herself in holistic health and healing at the Graduate Institute. That sparked my interest. I decided to take the same program largely because I learned that Bernie Siegel was on faculty. And when I met with him and he agreed to be my mentor and my continued for not just me, but probably for thousands of people around the world, their chosen CD, chosen dad right? So that's when it all began, where I started to understand and make sense of the, the world I was living in that didn't make sense. So I also knew that I had to trust the fact that I had to trust the process with my unshakable faith that I know that God doesn't kill people, people kill people. And I had unshakable faith. And I didn't know how I would smile again. I didn't know how I would have, I didn't know what a new normal would be because I wasn't in that place yet. 
So what did I do? I had to figure it out and I had to trust the process. So my studies began with Dr. Bernie Siegel and I approached him and I said, Bernie, um, with due respect, I, I understand that the program I'm about to take is basically what you carve out for yourself, what internships and what mentorships you want to choose to do. And I'm not sure what they are. He says, they'll land in your lap, just trust the process. And I, you'll hear me say that phrase a lot, trust the process, because it's what I do. So he said, come to my house with a legal pad, if you will, or a pad of paper with your first 10 questions. I said, okay. Well, I was over the moon and I have to be honest with you, I was very excited and that I was going to be in the presence of this incredible legend and he doesn't live far from my house, which made it even more wonderful. So being able to be in his presence and have him walk me through, guide me, support me, teach me was incredible. The first question I had was, can people be born evil? Absolutely not. He said he shook his head. And he said, it's in the absence of love that people do bad things. And I said, I believe you 98%. However, there's a 2% of me that questions you. Questions. He said, good. I want you to question absolutely everything I say and do. And every doctor and everyone you meet, because you need to grow and learn and explore every option and avenue. I said, okay. So... He said, your first assignment will be to go to the prison system and ask the prisoners themselves if they believe they were loved. I said, what? He said, that's right. He said, what's your next question? So I said, well, the word forgiveness, I understand it. I truly do. I understand the word that If I hold on to anger and angst and bitterness and hatred, it will define me. And it will take me down under. He wins and I lose. And that's not the life I want to live. However, I can't use that word. I can't use that word. Growing up between two brothers, one was a little fresh. He, you know, being bullied and living with two brothers on an all boy street with all boy cousins, it was never easy. And I always wanted a sister. I just wanted a sister. And so I said to God, I'm going to ask you to bless me with two daughters so that they have each other. And I'm going to trust the process. All right. So I knew back then that I had to just trust the process. So there we go. Bernie says to me, Audrey, I want you to trust me and your next assignment to find a new word for forgiveness will be, or to find your way through the concept of forgiveness is to study pastoral counseling with my dear friend, Reverend Robert Henderson, and you will learn and you will grow and you will come up with something. I said, okay. And I said to him, you know, I want to understand you, Bernie. I want to understand your mantras. What words do you live by? He said, well, I live by the words, you must do what makes you happy. Not what you do to make other people happy, because that plays a role in meaning and purpose in our lives, certainly. However, I would like you to share with me what it is that makes you happy. If you were to carve out no less than 10% of the day for you, what is it you do where you get lost in time? Because that was the next question. What is his meditation? He said, whatever you do where you get lost in time is where you need to be every day. And that way, what happens is you create a pause in your day, a pause a meditative pause so that one day doesn't roll into the next and the days don't roll into the weeks and the months and the years. 
And then you ask yourself at the end of the year, what, wait a minute, where did the year go? What happened? Because you didn't fill it with what you love to do. You didn't create the pauses and you didn't fill your own bucket. I said, okay, I, I understand that. I said, um, there are many things that I do. He said, we're going to talk about that later. Okay. I said, what books can you recommend for me to read? Now, this part of what I'm about to share with you is mystical, magical, real, and it is very powerful. He takes me into his little study in the back of his house where he had a, um, a room that was jam-packed with books and manuscripts and it was jam-packed to the point where, I got to be honest with you, there was no place to sit. I had to sit on the floor because the chairs had books. There were books on the tables. There were books up to the wall, to the ceiling. And he had a, like a, a Home Depot little stepladder, right? And um, he climbs up on this little stepladder. And I'm nervous because he's, you know, he was a little older and I didn't didn't want him to fall. He said, you sit on the floor and I'll throw you books. I said, he said, you catch. I said, okay. So the first book that he throws down to me is Dan Millman's A Peaceful Warrior. And then he threw Solzhenitsyn. And then he threw all these other books of holistic health and healing and spirituality and the work that he's done with the other masters. And then last of all, he says, wait, this is the most important book. This is how I live my life. The book was by Thornton Wilder and it was called The Bridges of San Rui Rey, a story about people that fall from this bridge to their death. And at the this book that he has, he's holding it very lovingly like it's going to save his life. And he throws it to me. Now, mind you, the book was very old. The binding that, that had the, um, the glue holding the binding was falling apart. So the book was held with a rubber band so it wouldn't fall apart. And it was yellowed and brittle and old. And he said, take the rubber band off, don't break the book and read the very end because those are the words I live by. Now I'm gonna paraphrase, it goes something like this. There's the land of the living and the land of the dead. And watch my fingers, the, the bridge is love. See my five fingers like this? All right. There's the land of the living, the land of the dead. And love is eternal. The land, the land of the living and the land of the dead. And love is eternal. To paraphrase, something like this. Well, he said, for as long as you love and you live and you love, our loved ones live forever. When you let go, they're gone. But if, for as long as you live and you love, they live. Because love is eternal. That's it. Love is eternal. The land of the living, the land of the dead, and love is eternal. I kept repeating that, repeating that in my head because it meant something very, very powerful. So hold on to that thought because I'm going to take you to another part. He shared with me a lot of different other mantras that he lives by and never say never. And he gave me a number of different quotes that he lives by that I'll thread through uh, this, um, this time that we have together. So I asked him a number of other questions and he, and he was quick to respond and he, and he shared with me and um, pretty soon it was getting a little bit later and it was time for, for me to leave. And I had this basket that had a handle on it that was filled with about a 10 books, very heavy, big, big basket. And he, and he said, uh, Audrey, I'm going to walk you out to your car. And what you're going to do is you're going to read all those books and you're going to make a book report with all those books by the end of the week. And I said, really? You're kidding, right? He said, of course I'm kidding. Skim through them, extract whatever it is you want to learn, pack it away. He says, this program is for you. 
it will unfold and come to be as it should. So I said, I believe you. So what happens? This is the magical part. And I've written about this. I got in my car and I was on the Merritt Parkway. He was in Woodbridge, Connecticut, 40 minutes south of me, headed north. It was a really beautiful day, unlike today, because we have cold weather and rain. And this big, big, beautiful sky and these gorgeous clouds. And I have no radio on, no music. I am in my thoughts. And my head is spinning because I'm trying to process everything that I learned from him. And I'm going over everything in my head, pretty much almost pinching myself that I was in the presence of someone incredible because his wisdom, his love, and his presence, just his presence was just incredible. So as I'm driving, I had to pull over. Why? It was validated in the sky. There were these two giant clouds which seemed to be miles apart. And like, I take my five fingers and you draw five lines in the sky. He, there were five lines of clouds connecting the two clouds, the bridge of love. It was validated, it was in the sky. And I got filled with emotion and I just said to myself, thank you, dear God, thank you, Bernie. Thank you, thank you for validating what I already know, but the fact that it is now written in the sky to validate, to prove, and to understand, to never, ever question your intuition, never question what you've been told to learn, and trust gets better. You ready? So I'm driving home, get in the house, pull the car in the driveway, and I can hear my phone ringing in the kitchen. I missed the call. However, I pushed play for message. Good afternoon, Audrey Carlson. This is Susie Hen Henniker from the Brooklyn prison in Brooklyn, Connecticut. I got your name through the survivors of homicide, the club nobody wants to belong to. I got your name from the survivors of homicide through a program called Voices. And it turns out that um, our speaker for tomorrow at noon cannot come. And I was hoping that you would be available to fill in and tell your story to our 50 prisoners tomorrow. I took a deep breath. I said, this, how is this happening? How is this all happening? Wow. So I just didn't even waste moments. I called her back immediately, said, I will be there. I will be there. Just give me the address. I hang up. I immediately called Bernie. I said, Bernie, I just left your house less than an hour ago, one hour. And this is what happened. The clouds and the phone call. And I said, what did you do? How did, how did this happen? He said, well, he said, uh, I have a direct connection to the um, chairman of the board. And we're not talking Frank Sinatra. He said, when I was a little child, I had a near-death ex um, experience and I died and I went to heaven and I met God. From that point on, I have a direct connection to God. And I asked him when you were leaving to make sure to take care of you and to make sure all of this could happen for you. He said, in an hour? I said, this is, this was incredible. This was just incredible. My, my feet were not hitting the, the ground. I was over the moon and my head was spinning. I could not, I could not wrap my head around the fact that all of this was happening for me, not to me, but for me, right? So once I was able to kind of like catch my breath from the, the excitement of it all and the the meaning behind it, the, the magical, mystical, wonderful gift that I've been given. I saw a, uh, on, um, I got an assignment from graduate school that I had to read a poem or a prayer, something like the beginner's mind. I think it was a Buddhist 
concept prayer. And I can't remember it all, but all that mattered was that I remembered the three, three lines that took me from that moment to the next morning because I was scared. I got to be honest with you. Why was I scared? I had to go to a prison and talk to 50 prisoners and in my mind, not pretend, not see what I thought would look like Jonathan Carney, the guy who killed my daughter. I had to look and, and say, it is not him. It is not him. You have, you're here for a reason and you're going to, you're going to do this. You're going to do this. Something good will come of this. Something good will come of this. What? I wasn't, I don't know. The Buddhist prayer or whatever the beginner's mind was something like this. No judgment, no expectations, only love. No judgment, no expectations, only love. And I kept saying that like a mantra over and over and over. So that when I showed up that next morning, that next day at noon, 50 men in orange jumpsuits came walking out. They all took their seats. I chose to sit on one of those industrial tables that they pulled out for me with a, with a chair, but I chose to sit on the table so I could kind of dangle my legs and kind of like create a comfort place for myself. So I basically said, we don't know each other. I don't, I don't want to know what you've done. I don't want to know your names. I don't want to know your crimes. And I need you to understand I am here on an assignment and all of that doesn't matter, except that the assignment is to ask you and to learn from my master's program, if you believe you were loved. So we're gonna start with the fact that I'm gonna ask you a few questions. The first question was, of the 50 men, how many of you have children? 25. How many of you love your children? 25. How many of your children love you back? Two. I kind of sat back. How many of you are in a rehabilitation program that believe you can be rehabilitated, break the cycle of violence in your homes, in your churches, in your neighborhoods, whatever? Two, how many of you believe you were loved? The hands went up and down and up and down and up and down. They weren't sure how to answer that question. The bell went off and they had to go back to their respective cells. I leave. I get letters in the mail days later thanking me. They want me to come back and talk more about this love stuff. So that went on for several weeks. And I came up with the fact that it is true that in the absence of love, people do very bad things. However, here's the however part. I still live in wonder with that 2%. I'm still exploring. I'm still learning. And I'm still on that same track. Does it consume me? Absolutely not. Do I live in that place? Absolutely not. The next thing I did was went to Reverend um, Henderson's program of pastoral counseling where there were every single religion there, which was wonderful because it all came down to love. And the word that I came up with in lieu of forgiveness was letting go. I learned how to take a learned how to breathe differently and I learned how to attach emotions into my breath. I learned how to take the count of six to breathe in what I need and breathe out. I would breathe in love. You start with yourself, self-love. I learned how to breathe in love and exhale love. Why? Because somewhere out there in this beautiful universe, there's somebody out there who has nobody to love them. And if I, before I even get out of bed, if I can do this incredible gift and breathe love out to somebody who has nobody to love them, I've already done a good deed, you see. The second thing I do is breathe into the count of six, what I need to, to get me through the day. I forecast my day, where I'm going, what I'm doing, and what I need. Do I need strength? Do I need patience? Do I need calm, laser focus, resilience? What is it you need? What is it I need? I would breathe it in. I would breathe out what I need to get rid of. 
And that's how I would pave my day. And this is how I learned how to use the word letting go. So I took Jonathan Kearney, the guy who killed my daughter, created an invisible bubble. I put him into this invisible bubble. I exhaled and I blew him out into the universe. Now there's intention here. I said to God, I believe that we are all your children. If this is true and I know it to be true, I'm giving Jonathan back to you and he's yours. I let him go. I detached myself. That's another word for forgiveness, detaching yourself. I was able to live my life. I learned how to fill it with little by little, little by little, took a very long time, years, how to fill it with the gift, giving myself permission to live and to smile and to love and to somehow find happiness. What did that look like? I wasn't sure. But I wasn't living with hatred, bitterness, or anger. It was a journey. So the words that also resound with me that are very palpable and very emotional are the words from uh, funny girl. It's a musical, the, the song people need people who are the luckiest people in the world. I sought out people to help me through therapy. I sought out every course I could in spirituality. I sought out programs. I sought out workshops and seminars wherever I could go to surround myself with positivity, love, no judgment. And I knew as a, as a lifelong learner that I would find my way. And I also had to learn how to trust the process of, I was going to be okay. I didn't know how. I didn't know how, but I knew. Now here's, here's the key, one key thing for me, honestly, that I live, that I've lived with my whole life but I didn't know how to understand it because I'm a little kid, gratitude. I've always looked at what I have, not what I don't have, what I can do, not what I can't, because I've had lots of different traumas. I've lost loved ones. I have gone through ovarian cancer. I have broken, I have fallen a few times. I fractured a knee 15 years ago and was out of commission for four months, couldn't work. And I had to learn how to breathe into the pain. I fell 10 weeks ago and fractured my arm playing tennis. It's doing well. I'm still in rehab. And I know the body naturally heals itself. Trust the process, get stronger. However, we all know, well, I know. God helps those who help themselves. And that's going to be a segue a little bit later into the topic of hope. So gratitude is a way for me to trust that it will pave the way to happiness. Because if you live with under live with negativity and poor me and woe is me, and I don't I can't I can't run a marathon anymore, and I've been out of commission for several months and I can't do this and I can't do that. Well, I don't wanna live like that and I don't wanna hang around people that behave like that either. So I've learned how to create boundaries and also how to, I don't know, I guess you can vote people off the island, right? So when you're going through trauma, I, I learned that we have to really address our elementary needs and remember to drink water eat clean. Don't eat foods that are inflammatory that will manifest in dis-ease and destroy the body. And to walk. Bernie Siegel taught me that all the answers we seek come from within. All the answers we seek come from within and to trust the process. And when you struggle to find those answers, put on your sneakers and go for a walk because the answers oftentimes are found in nature. 
So we went for a walk. And he took me by a brook. And the brook, <clears throat> it was summertime. So the brook, um, the water in this brook made its way around these rocks. Some were big, some were smaller. Now the water represents life force, life ongoing forever, right? The rocks would represent the obstacles that we all have. They're unavoidable. They're big, they're little, they're small, and they move around. They're never in the same place, right? So he said, what do you see? And I tell him, he said, we are connected to nature. Soon, soon here, our winter, things will freeze up. We sometimes freeze up and get stuck. However, we have to trust the process. Spring will come, the sun will come out, and the water, once again, will melt the, the, the ice, and the water will find its way. And this is life. We are always being redirected. Something good will come of it. Now, what I've added to that is don't come up empty-handed. Don't come up empty handed. What have you learned? Where are you going? Trust the process. Just know. If not today, another day. We all need accountability, buddy, so that when we do, when it was COVID and we were all isolated, I regarded it as solitude. And I found a buddy and we walked and we walked and we walked every day. We walked every day. And I took one of my poodles with me. So we all got exercise, we all need each other. And having each other, having accountability buddies and having people in your life that have your back, who you trust, who understand you without judgment, expectations, and only love. And those three words can get me through my life. So, We talked about hobbies and he said, what do you do when you get lost in time? And I said, well, for one thing, it would be music. I have played piano my entire life. So since I've been five, my mother was a, an accomplished concert pianist. My father was a professor of physics and chemistry. However, he was a jazz museum musician. And I was plunked at the piano when I was very little and I couldn't play outside until I did one hour of lessons. So I was disciplined. As a child, my parents, we grew up with tough love. And to this day, I continue to play. And it has brought me to another level of meaning and purpose and meditation. I play every day. And I was asked to play at a place in Bloomfield, Connecticut called Duncaster. It's a graduated care center. And I play in a memory unit with people that don't remember what they ate for lunch. However, last week, something magical happened. I saw the same people, about 30, 40 people roll into this great room where there's a grand piano, of which I had donated. And some of them sleep, some of them sing, and some of them hold hands and cry, and some of them just sit there. and. Most of them are, are, are Alzheimer's with dementia or a combination of one or the other. Yet there was this other, and, and some other people come from other parts of the complex because they just love music and they don't have memory issues. They just independent living. Well, there was a lady last week who I didn't recognize. And she had, she was very well dressed, very put well put together, looked lovely. And, um, she said, when I was taking uh, in between songs, I tell, I try to get people to tap into um, their memory. This song came from a musical, who was in it, why, whatever. And this woman said, you know, when I was a senior in high school, there was a recital where I sang the party's over. And I stood on the grand piano on the stage and I sang the song in my blue dress with the rhinestone collar. I said, what a beautiful memory. Thank you. This is really beautiful. You know, I got to tell you, I think I have that song in my songbook. How about we try to do that? She's, oh, no, 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 no. I'm not going to stand on the piano. I said, no, she's 92. I said, I'm not going to have you stand on the piano. 
However, she, I played the song and I saw she was singing to herself. When everyone dispersed and went back to their respective rooms, the nurse came to me and she said, did you know, do you need to know this woman does not remember an hour ago, but she remembered the song and what you brought to her was a gift. So she got lost in time. I got lost in time. We connected through music and it has been my meditation. It has brought meaning and purpose. It has given the gift to many people. There are a lot of things that I do where I get lost in time. It could be a conversation. It could be a book. It could be anything. So pets, I don't know life without pets. And I want to explain that We've had standard poodles my whole life, largely because my brother, when I was growing up, now I'm 70, so we're talking 70 years ago, my brother had um, asthma, and we could only have dogs that didn't shed, so it's the breed I've had. And the, the, the lessons that they teach us are many outside of the one everyone understands is unconditional love and loyalty. They teach us how to be in the moment. They don't know tomorrow. They let go of an hour ago. They only know now they're teaching us to do the same. Whatever life throws at them, they wag their tails and they're teaching us to do the same. They're also teaching us a lesson that many of us don't want to talk about because they leave us and they take us through grief. And It's never easy. It's never easy to lose loved ones and understand that our pets have short lives, shorter lives than the big elephants and the and the snakes and the big turtles that live forever and ever. And I asked God when I was a little girl, why, why did you do this? Why did you, why do all these other animals that live seem to live forever? We can't take into our hearts and our homes. And yet our, our furry friends, our doggies and our kitties, you, they, they leave us so soon. Why? Why? It's because they're teaching us how to go through grief. They're teaching us that we can't go through the life cycle without going through grief. And we have to. So my dog, Max, is uh, approaching 14. We've never had a dog that has live that long. And the other day I thought he might've had a mini stroke because he started to act very, hmm, very different. And he just seemed um, off and something was really wrong. And so I know something's wrong and I have to prepare myself for the end. The next thing would be volunteering because a lot of us need to understand many people that we have that giving of yourself is 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 an inc incredible gift expecting nothing in return that so many of us those that volunteer understand the gift that is ongoing resilience is a lot of people have experienced a full range of emotions and fear and gratitude and love and there's a reservoir to tap into where we have strength and mental toughness and survival skills helping us to navigate through the rough waters and mountains and rocky paths. And life takes us through there as long as we continue to learn and grow with grit and resilience. Humor. Uh, humor for me, uh, is, in some respects, can be a um, survival skill. Humor is, uh, we, 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 gain our endorphins, we laugh, we belly laugh and yoga laughter and all the wonderful things that come with humor and life has to be filled with humor. I also believe that we have to challenge ourselves to do things that we've never done before so that we can rewire our brain with uh, neuroplasticity and put ourselves less at risk for dementia and Alzheimer's and such so that we are lifelong learners and to challenge yourself because at the end of the day, no one wants to have to say before their last breath, when someone says, what do you wish you could have done? Not so much a regret, but what do you, what, what was missing? I didn't take those risks. 
And you have to ask yourself, that's a whole other subject with the risks that what what's the worst case scenario, right? So I also try to replace the word but with and. It's not negative. The word and, the power of the and. So let's go there and give ourselves permission to be human. Tal Ben-Shahar, who I did my positive psychology, says that and uh, he has a little saying, give me a second, appreciate the good and the good appreciates. I also say every day to everyone that I know and love, even people I just know, me, what is the best part of your day? Focus on, at this point, what is the best part of your day? And for me, it's connecting with you, meeting you and seeing Ramesh again and being able to perhaps share a story that would give other people hope. So I am going to go right into hope. So we've talked a lot about happiness and we talked about it as an emotion. And I may have mentioned when I took a, a program with Dr. Jean folks, she asked the classroom if they had to choose between happiness and peace, what would you do? Peace paves the way to happiness. It may not look easy for a lot of people whose lives have been shattered and everything has been taken from them. And if they can only hope for peace, it paves the way to happiness. And Gandhi said, be the change you want to see in the world. Lead by example. Even if you can't do something physically, you can smile. You can show and exhibit kindness. So, hope. The problem with a wish is that you can do something to make the future better. It's not a wish that things will get better, but an actual belief even when there may be no evidence that anything will change. Hope is not pretending that troubles don't exist. It's the trust that we can find the source of strength that is within us and lead us through the darkness. Hope comes alongside with difficulty. Being open to discussing fears can foster hope. Hope is a decision. Hope can be a part of one's upbringing from childhood. It can be developed through life's experiences, passed on from friends, from spiritual or religious philosophy, or from examples in life. It can be taught. We can teach ourselves. Imagination is the instrument of hope. We have to imagine ourselves in the future context. Hope is a precious commodity that is often difficult to define and it is very important to keep alive. It often gives a person a glimpse of the future and is supported by enduring fortitude, courage, and ingenuity, often in the face of adversity. Hope is synonymous with a positive will to live and affects a positive outcome whatever that might be. It's about taking action. So I'm talking about hope as a verb. I can hope all day long and I can dream all day long and I'm, I can live in that place of hope and dream. However, if I don't put it into action and God helps those who help themselves, none of this is going to most often come to be. Hope is the foundation on which we build our wellness. It's our most vital emotion. Hope provides emotional strength. Think about the hostages that are still being held. Think about other prisoners that are being held in camps, in prison. Think about prisoners that are, in, not, not prisoners that are incarcerated. I'm talking about people that create their own prison. They live in their own prison. Right? Hope is often so silent, but what makes it so powerful is that it can surprise us at a moment's notice. It whispers, hold on, my love, hold on. 
People speak of hope as if it is this delicate ephemeral thing made of whispers and spider's webs. It's not. Hope has dirt on her face, blood on her knuckles, the grit of the cobblestones in her hair, and just spat out a tooth as she rises for yet another go. Keep getting up, get the dirt off of you, keep going again and again and again. There's no such thing as false hope. Either you have hope or you don't. So that, that is a lot of what I um, put together. There are some other things that I had scribbled down to share with you. Um, like the story that I wrote in um, the, the book that Bernie, um, I was so humbled to be included in with Bernie. And there's a lot of other things that I have trusted that there is that invisible, intangible world called the spirit world. We need to learn the language for those that want to connect and understand that even though we can't see it, touch it, feel it, it's there. And to understand that there's a way to connect. You can do this through dreams. You can do this with different senses that we all have, different ones. My husband can hear occasionally, not very often, Elizabeth. My daughter, Leslie, has seen shadows, has been able to see her presence. And I have been able to feel her presence. And yet, this is really, this is really quite something. Max, my dog, connects with her every afternoon in this room that I'm in. Because this room has pictures of her and all the books that I've studied. And he comes in here every afternoon and he somehow, he, he gets lost in space. He gets zoned out. He's like, fixed. I can't um, distract him because he's lost in space with, and I know he's with Elizabeth and I've had different readings for those that don't understand or believe. I do with mediums that have the ability to connect with their vibrations. Uh, that he connects with Elizabeth as a vehicle to get to me. So I know she's with us every day. And I, I feel her presence. And through him, he lets me know she's here. And that's very powerful. So it's it's a hope and it's a trust. And I have never questioned God. I have always trusted the process. I've always understood that my innate gift of intuition is always right. And to go with it, just go with it. And to understand also that everything happens for a reason, whether we like it or not. And to, to dig a little deeper and try to understand what we can learn from it and I continue to learn. I'm one of those lifelong learners like many of us are. And um, I am hoping that I am given the gift of many, many, many more years so that I can grow with wisdom and maybe have a, a little bit more of what Bernie Siegel has so that uh, I can continue to help others and share my story and just maybe give somebody else hope that they're not alone because we're not alone. We have each other. Thank you. How do, how are we doing? We still have a little time. Other, do, why don't you, anybody have any questions for me? Yes, definitely, ma'am. We'll check with the audience. But before that, I would like to thank you for this enlightening session. We are really grateful that you shared such precious moments from your journey with all of us. And I'm Sure, we are taking away profound learnings, inspiration, and hope from today's session. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Participants, if anyone wants to ask something or even share something, please go ahead. You can drop your messages in the chat box. I can read it out or unmute yourself and speak up.
Hello. I just don't know what to say, but thank you for sharing what you've shared. And uh, it's very inspiring to know of you. And thank hope, you. yeah, hope paves the way. So it's very beautiful. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you. So good to see you. Good to see you. Ramesh, you're looking well. You're wearing a turtleneck. Is it cold or chilly where you are? Yes, it is. Uh, and I try to protect myself, perhaps overprotect myself. Me too. I have socks and sweaters and mm -hmm. warm clothes because it's raw here. And we have had finally the rain that we've been needing. We started, we're in a drought. We've had glorious weather for, as you know, you were here for the most beautiful autumn and fall. And finally, we're getting rain, and um, I'm welcoming it because we need it so, so much. And I thank everyone for your kind words, and thank you very much for the thank you. So I'm, thank, I'm reading. Yes, so is there anyone else that uh, I'd like to just let those that um, would like to connect with me that they can, and I... Um, Welcome anyone who would like to contact me uh, personally. And if you have anything that you want to share with me or ask me, or if you need any support or assistance, uh, I am very happy to help. And um, my email is Audrey, A-U-D-R-E-Y, A-B-C-7-7 at gmail.com. I uh, abide by HIPAA, which is the Privacy Practice Act. So whatever you share with me stays with me. I don't uh, share with anyone else. And I um, offer any assistance or any um, support to anyone who may need it. If you'd like it, I'm here. Thank you. Thank you, Audrey, ma'am. That's very nice of you. Thank uh, you. Dr. Bijlani, sir, I request you to share your thoughts, please. Thank you. Of course. Uh, thank you, Audrey, for uh, having this talk uh, entirely around your own uh, personal history. And it's an incredible personal history, the type that uh, very few of us would have anything comparable to talk about. And uh, therefore, whatever comes from you, it comes from the heart and uh, illustrates the general principles as you try to do throughout much better than any amount of uh, abstract talk would do. And uh, that is something which uh, really thankful to you for. Uh, the, uh, I'll not be very uh, methodical because I just jotted down a few points as you were talking. And... Uh, uh, Therefore, it may look a little incoherent, but uh, just make them briefly. Firstly, when you said that uh, you told Bernie that uh, I believe uh, that uh, people are not born evil, they turn evil because they don't get love. 98% of you believed in it, 2% didn't. And you went through a process. And even at the end of it, you said even today, that 2% still lives in that wonder. Aren't some people really born evil? Now, that is something which uh, I'm sure that you understand why that happen, may happen. And Bernie also understands too. But the reason he told you that, no, it's because of uh, not getting love that they turned evil was probably because of the context. The context in which he was answering, the situation in which you were placed. And that's why he tried to uh, sort of hide that, take that 2% out away. Now, why that 2% still stays is uh, because now that you are, uh, and Bernie always has been, more and more familiar with uh, what happens after death. We are actually there in some other world. There are spirit worlds. There are worlds other than this one. And uh, in uh, the Sanatana tradition, it's believed that not only that happens, the soul keeps coming back to this world, gets embodied again. So the soul is on a long journey. And uh, we may start with a level of consciousness, which is uh, rather low. I will not say like that of animals because animals give evidence of a very high level of consciousness. They may not speak like us. Uh, so I will not say we come like an animal, but we come at a very low level of consciousness with the 
a very selfish and what we may call an evil personality right at birth. So we are born like that. But then uh, nobody's soul is destined to always stay at that level. Uh, by hit and trial, by trial and error, somehow at the end of life, we may end up a little consciousness, which is slightly higher than the, what we arrive at. And uh, the process continues from life to life. And uh, the journey would be complete only when we manifest as fully as is possible for a human being, the divinity hid hidden within each one of us. So therefore, right at birth, we are not born exactly alike. We, we are equal. We have the same uh, divinity hidden within us, but the expression is not the same. The fraction that is expressed is different right at birth, and that is what probably accounts for that two-person doubt that probably some people are born evil. Uh, and uh, then, you know, you found forgiveness very difficult. It's very easy to understand why that was difficult. And then you found substitutes, like uh, letting go. Uh, and uh, then you also gave... Uh, yes, so letting go. And uh, that we may, that love may continue. And uh, if we continue to love those, love our loved ones, then uh, the love can still reach them. And uh, further that we not only have to continue loving those whom we have loved, but uh, extend our love who have nobody to love them. So in fact, basically it all boils down to love, as you said. And uh, that is... Uh, the key to a meaningful life. Uh, life and, has uh, little meaning without love. Life has little meaning without love. Yeah. Truly. Thank you. Uh, just a, a few things more. Uh, yeah, we all uh, know that uh, uh, whatever happens to us comes with a meaning and a purpose. But then you said we can go, thing. we will be redirected and then we should not come out empty handed. That was a valuable addition uh, because we can come out uh, better than what we started. We don't just have to go through it. We have to come out better. Then, you know, your uh, appreciation of music as one of the things that can help go through difficult phases of life and bring love and joy uh, is something which Arunima must have found uh, music to her ears because uh, she, her brother, and her sister-in-law, all three of them are well in, into music, and uh, so was her mother. So she comes from a family of uh, which is full of music, and uh, uh, I'll send you some uh, video links in which you'll find her singing. This sounds she wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, uh, about humor, uh, which can uh, uh, help uh, any situation light. Uh, Bernie Siegel has an excellent sense of humor, as you know, and uh, as you might recollect, when I asked him how one can cultivate it, he gave one of those uh, wonderful one-liners, don't grow up. Just those three words, and <laughs> that's how you can cultivate a <laughs> sense of humor. <laughs> yeah. So, these are some of it down, uh, which I thought uh, may bear repeating, just to reinforce them. And there's nothing really much one can add to what you have said. Uh, but all the same, there's a lot that you can add and uh, for which there was not enough time. So I'm sure you will once again appear on this platform and uh, share some other things which uh, would uh, inspire many to live a more meaningful life, a life full of greater love, a life which is full of peace, which in turn paves the way for happiness, as you said. Thank you. Thank you once again. Thank you with love and gratitude for, I was very honored to be on your program and I hope to see you again and we will. And thank you so much. So I want to wish everyone, well, we have the day in front of us and you have the evening. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I can see uh, through your window darkness and you can see yes. through my window. <laughs> The light. Right. Yes. Oh, great. So I wish everybody um, the best in health and happiness and love and peace. Thank you.
Thank you, ma'am. Thank, Thank you, you, Dr. Bichlani. Uh, before closing, I would like to inform that the recording of today's session and all the Yes Talks are published on our YouTube channel, Yes Spirituality. Uh, you can explore the channel for extensive content on yoga, education, spirituality, and related subjects like self-help, psychology, and wellness. Thanks once again, Audrey, ma'am. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you. It was lovely Thank having you. you. Thank you. Thank you. We will close today's session with a moment of peaceful silence. Namaste. Namaste.